let me begin with a word of thanks uh, for, for this invitation. At BJC, we know that every request to preach at one of our churches is a holy invitation. And it's especially gratifying to be able to give back to a congregation that has given so much to BJC over the years in your prayers and encouragement, financial gifts, and friendship. As the BJC staff member who probably spends the most time with coalition partners and meeting with congressional staffers, I spend a lot of time saying, not that kind of Baptist. So I was thrilled with this opportunity to share a little bit about one of our core Baptist principles, religious freedom for all people. In political advocacy, this principle becomes the separation of church and state is good for both. Some of you might be new to the Baptist tradition and some of y'all might be lifelong Baptist as I am. To tell you a little bit about my um, Baptist story, Baptist connections, um, I've worshiped in a number of different houses of worship, but have only ever been a member of a Baptist church. My father's family helped found a Baptist church in Memphis, the church where my parents would eventually meet and marry. As a child, many of our family vacations were chaperoning the church youth um, camp or mission trips. I was baptized at the age of six, went on my first overnight out of town mission trip as a seventh grader dedicated my life to full-time Christian ministry as a high school student, and eventually earned two degrees from Baptist colleges. I'm about as Baptist as they come, but I'll admit, for the first half of my life, I never really considered the question that we have before us today. Why Baptist? Core to our Baptist DNA is the belief in and advocacy for religious freedom for all people. It is common for persecuted religious groups to seek the freedom to practice their own faith. Baptists were unique in that from our earliest days, we advocated for religious freedom, not just for ourselves, but for everyone, whether they be followers of Christ, um, belong to other religious traditions, or even rejected religion altogether. Religious freedom is an important biblical theme. The Bible is the story of God's love for humanity. We were created to live in relationship with God, but God gave us the free will to choose whether and how we will respond to that invitation. Today's passages are probably familiar to many of you, or at least parts of them were. Both have made it into our English lexicon and have been turned into wall art, medallions, t-shirts, bumper stickers, and all sorts of Christian merchandise. Growing up, we had a small plaque by our back door that said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The churches, especially my childhood and youth that helped shape me, tended to read the Bible very stoically. But I've come to believe that we miss a lot of meaning if we only read passages in a way that's as sterile as an operating room. In seminary, I was introduced to the teachings of a church father, Ignatius, and he taught us that God speaks to us through our imaginations and encouraged a form of contemplation where the reader puts him or herself into the story and imagines the sights and sounds and smells and tastes and touches of that story. So I appreciated Kathy's reading of the story with emotion and inflection, um, but I want us to, to try this Ignatian method. I want you to imagine being a part of this, this audience and you see Joshua standing standing before you. I think if, if we use this message, the, I'm sorry, if we, if we use this method, the Joshua story feels very modern. When I'm sitting in that audience and I'm looking up to Joshua, I picture him as a coach giving the hype speech at the pep rally before the big game. We all know a question is coming and we know the expected answer, but this speech is gonna fire us up to give us that momentum that we need to overcome the challenges and obstacles ahead. In verse 15, Joshua clearly presents the religious choice to all those who have gathered. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, he's telling them to search your hearts, decide the path that you want to take. Then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. He's telling them there's a choice. You have seen all of your options. 
And then he lands his speech. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua made his decision, but won't and can't make that decision for others. Again, sitting in, in this crowd, I imagine the crowd responds enthusiastically, like that team fired up to take the field for the championship game. They recount God's mercy and protection and boldly declare, we too will serve the Lord because he is our God. The passage ends with Joshua setting up a stone as a reminder of the covenant that they have all made on this day. Stones are often used in the Bible to mark holy moments, and this is no different. The Lord has brought the Israelites out of slavery and to the promised land. Many times under the leadership of Moses and Joshua, the people complained and were obstinate. But now in the twilight of Joshua's leadership over them, they have a choice for their future. They can stay the course and worship the God who has protected and provided for them or align themselves with the gods of other nations. What they cannot do is both. As Jesus would later teach us, you can't serve two masters for either you will hate one and love the other or you will hold to one and despise the other. You can't serve both masters. You must make a choice. Joshua sets up the stone so that people can remember their covenant, remember their decision, and remember this encounter with God. For Baptists, our doctrine of religious freedom for all people is one of these memorial stones that each generation must choose whether or not to remember. Our earliest Baptist leaders spoke of the need for all people to be free to make their own decisions in matters of faith and spirituality. In 1612, one of our Baptist co-founders, Thomas Helwes, published the first defense in English of religious freedom for all. A defense, by the way, which uh, King James I, and yes, that King James, uh, threw him into prison where he would later die. Since God offered relationship, no king or government should have the authority to demand conformity in matters of faith. Helwitz knew then what we know now, that for faith to be vital, it must be voluntary. Roger Williams gives us another stone marker to remember our call for religious freedom. Before he founded the First Baptist Church in America, Williams had been a Puritan minister who was exiled from the Massachusetts Bay Colony for his radical ideas on religious freedom. At the time, the Puritans were convinced that only they correctly worshiped God and that there could be no deviation from their um, substance. Williams, on the other hand, is famous for his promotion of the concept that government should respect individual choices in matters of faith. His most famous one-liner on religious freedom would fit great on a bumper sticker, forced worship stinks in God's nostrils. Williams was also the first to write about the need for a wall or a hedge between the garden of God's church and the wilderness of the world. Perhaps most poignantly, he also wrote that God didn't need, quote, the help of the sword of steel to assist the sword of the spirit in, in the affairs of conscience. Williams established Rhode Island as a lively experiment that proved citizenship and civic responsibility need not be tied to a state approved orthodoxy. Baptist in the revolutionary era built upon Roger Williams call for faith freedom for all. We faced persecution for being the wrong kind of Christian. Our pastors were fined, whipped, imprisoned and banished all for preaching the gospel without a license. Baptists were prohibited from conducting our own marriage ceremonies or from receiving and giving the sacraments all because we dared to worship God in the way that we felt uh, scripture demanded. One of the most famous Baptists during this time was Virginia pastor, John Leland. Leland advocated for all people to be equally free, including Jews, Muslims, pagans, and Christians. Leland's sermons and writings on religious freedom are far too numerous to recount in one short sermon, but there is one story that I would like to share. 
We know that in the beginning, Leland actively opposed ratification of the new federal constitution that James Madison had drafted. The no religious test clause in Article 6 might be a good start, but much more was needed. A mutual friend of, of theirs sent Leland's list of 10 constitutional grievances to Madison and encouraged James Madison to go meet with Pastor Leland as, quote, the Baptists, the preachers of that society, are much alarmed, fearing religious liberty is not sufficiently secured. Leland's primary concern was that there was nothing in the Constitution to stop a president and agreeable Congress from choosing one religious denomination and mandating support for it. While we don't know for certain how Madison convinced Leland to support the Constitution, all evidence suggests that the two leaders heard each other's perspective and agreed on a path forward. A letter from John Leland to James Madison the following year after Madison's first election to Congress reflects their ongoing cooperation. After congratulating Madison and giving him some advice, Leland boldly stated his expectation of soon to be Congressman James Madison that quote, if religious liberty is in any way threatened that I shall receive the earliest intelligence. Leland's dedication to securing religious freedom for all in our constitutional Republic is another stone for us to remember God's working among us. Many other Baptists over the, de over the decades have laid down a stone marker for religious freedom, including through the work of BJC. We at BJC stand on the shoulders of 400 years of Baptist history, working to extend and defend religious freedom for all. Because whether we're talking about atheist or Adventist, Baptist or Buddhist, Jews or Jehovah's Witnesses, humanist or Hindus, Methodist or Muslims, or any other group, we know that a threat to anyone's religious liberty is a threat to everyone's religious liberty. We are grateful for the partnership of Ravensworth and so many other like-minded individuals and churches across this country. You are the ones who make our work possible. Whether there is opposing Christian nationalism, denouncing religious privilege, or supporting indigenous groups fighting to preserve their sacred land, we have much work to do to build bridges and stand with our neighbors. So the next time someone asks you, why Baptist? I hope you will confidently and proudly respond, religious freedom for all. From our earliest days, Baptists sought religious freedom, not just for ourselves, but for all groups. This is our Baptist legacy to carry and to hand off to the next generation. May it be so.